Welcome to Money and Me. My guest this week is known as the godfather of the hedge fund industry. He's also a, a major philanthropist and investor in new businesses, as well as being a contributor and former treasurer of the Conservative Party. He is Lord Stanley Fink. Lord Fink, welcome to Money and Me. Well, thank you, Graham, and please call me Stanley. Most okay. people do. Thank you very much. I'll do that. Now, before we talk about your, your amazing career in the hedge fund industry, I want to kind of take you back to, to your childhood, because you know, there's a rather well-known prime minister who was the daughter of a grocer in Lincolnshire, and you're the son of a grocer in Manchester. What, what is it about growing up in a grocer's family that uh, leads to this amazing success? Well, I think my father, for most of my very young life, actually was a manufacturer of uh, wire lampshades that people used to cover with raffia, but he had a, a split from his brother, um, his business partner, mm -hmm. and um, his brother bought the business and my father ended up taking his share of the, the proceeds and reinvesting it in the grocery business. So he was really a grocer for the latter part of his career and probably my teenage years right. um, onwards. Um, and it, in my case, it was a different life because in the first business, my mother had not really worked. She'd been a stay-at-home mum, mm -hmm. but once... My parents bought the grocery shop. She was working full time. So, it, uh, and we used to sometimes in the holidays go and help. Mm. And I think it does give you um, a real hands on experience of the real world and the customers you have and the lives they live in a way that many other businesses don't. So I think it does give you a connection with the real world. Okay. And, and was kind of the topic of money or saving or investing ever discussed around the dinner table at home? It wasn't discussed as a sort of abstract topic, but I think as as you sort of live through the experience with the family and business and good months and bad months, you realise certain values your parents had and certain philosophy. So, for example, my, my parents were, 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 were savers. They, they had debt. They, they believed in mortgage debt, um, you know, a minor amount of business debt at some points, but really they tried to de-gear pretty quickly and believed it was better to be a, a saver than a spender. Um, putting things aside for a rainy day was very much part of their philosophy. Mm. And I guess they grew up in an era where the welfare state wasn't as prevalent and people really did have to look out for themselves. Mm, okay, because then you, uh, you studied law at university and yes. then you, you had a, a, a variety of, of different roles in different companies like Arthur Anderson, yes. Mars and Citibank. Uh, what, was there ever a kind of, at that stage, was there a plan as to how you wanted your career to unfold or were you kind of opportunistically jumping between things that just looked interesting? Um, it, it's, good, it's a very good question. I, I, I knew that I wanted to end up in business. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't specifically know which business, uh, perhaps except saying it probably wasn't going to be the grocery business. Um, but I, I didn't know at the time I went to university the subject of economics existed. My school was probably one of the last in Britain to do economics. And in fact, I gave an inaugural lecture to the pupils probably seven, eight years ago, so it was really late. Uh -huh. um, and so I'd done science up to A-level, and I really was more of a scientist than a lawyer. Uh -huh. But I thought a law degree gave me some skills I would need on my journey to become a, a rounded businessman. Right. And frankly, despite not really enjoying my law degree, I do find it very useful both in many of the businesses I've been involved in and also as a parliamentarian now, you know, the amount of legislation one reads. Yeah. I don't know how people without legal training understand what they're reading, actually. Mm. Mm. Okay, and, and I guess it was when you landed at Man Group that you started to get involved in, in the hedge fund business yes. at a time when most people wouldn't have known what the hedge fund was. Uh, how did that all come about, and, and, and where did you take uh, it? Again, it was serendipity. I joined Man um, having worked with them when they were a banking client of mine. I was at Citibank, and I really liked the firm. I, I, I spent an intensive period with them looking at how they would pass on the firm from the old generation to the younger generation mm. uh, by, by sort of uh, uh, effectively selling the business, but in effectively a leveraged buyout, buyout or buy-in, as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and I really got to know and like the managers in order to prepare the credit. I really had to understand the business. Mm. And I think they were impressed with what they saw, and they offered me a, a job shortly after the exercise finished, even though the exercise never ultimately happened. Uh, but we did get credit approval from the bank. And 
I felt that it was a sort of business that did was young and dynamic. Mm -hmm. At the time, most of its businesses were in the commodity business and the agricultural commodities, coffee, cocoa, sugar, and indeed the commodity business still exists today, but as an independent company. Um, and I joined in a, in a main finance role. Mm -hmm. um, I was fortunate then to get involved in a couple of large transactions that helped grow the company. And then I became the CFO, finance director, and I helped float the company in 1994. And um, it was only after the IPO that I was asked to take um, do a sideways move in effect and become the head of its rather small hedge fund business. Oh, right, because a lot of people you know, bandy this term around without really, I think, understanding it. Could you just you know, help me by defining what, what a hedge fund is and how it differs from a, a, a regular investment fund? Sure. Um, my definition, and it's been a, one that I've, I've not really uh, checked would be a, a universal one, but for me a hedge fund is a fund that is going to look for an absolute return, not a return relative to an index. Mm. It's a fund that can go short of markets as well as long. Mm -hmm. It can use leverage and derivatives in a way that many standard mutual, mutual funds can't. Um, and it, it generally um, has management who are assigned, through, who are motivated through incentive fees so that they're, they're aligned with their clients. Yeah. So those are the typical characteristics. But the range of instruments and strategies are just enormous. Mm. So the type I was mainly involved with, with were funds that traded the futures markets, which were historically commodities, but nowadays interest rates, stock indices, mm -hmm. even emission derivatives are part of what a modern CTA type hedge fund trades. And yet, uh, uh, you know, not all hedge funds have, have been as successful as they hoped mm -hmm. or achieved their goals. So if someone's thinking about investing in a hedge fund, you, what are the kind of characteristics they need to look for? Um, for me, um, if one is looking at a, at a personal level rather than going through a consultant, and there are consultants who advise on, on this, as there are many other subjects, uh, for me, one of the key things is to look for a strategy where management can articulate what they're doing. Mm. I've met many hedge funds where you speak to them and they cannot actually explain to you in words that make sense what their strategy is. Um, so make sure the strategy makes sense. Make sure that there's some sort of track record or experience. Mm -hmm. Have an understanding of the biggest loss that, that both has occurred and could theoretically occur. Mm -hmm. And ideally look at the way that the performance of that hedge fund fits the rest of your portfolio. So one of the reasons I've always liked the managed futures area is it tends to have a very low correlation to both the stock market and indeed things like the property market. Mm. So it often does very well in bear markets because it can go short equally as well as it can go long of markets. And, and I guess a lot of people think we're heading for a fairly turbulent time in the market. So does that mean potentially for the right kind of hedge fund, there's actually going to be some rich pickings perhaps in 2019? I, I think there will always be rich pickings for people of certain styles. Um, if the, the markets really go into a sort of bear market, then CTAs, managers who follow trends like the one um, I, I, I work with, ISAM, would do very well in that sort of market. If the markets are more range bound, then it would be different strategies that would do well. Mm. Um, but no, there, there will almost certainly be a, a hedge fund type that does well in virtually every market scenario. It's just making sure you're in the right type at the right time or you're looking at one that over time makes good returns. And, and is that a case of almost the equivalent of, of, of stock picking or can you kind of divert, can you take a single diversified hedge fund where you, you, you could benefit from all of those strategies in a single entity? The, the, the only type of hedge fund that really can benefit in all market strategies are funder funds or multi-strategy funds. And they, they do have issues because there can be two levels of fees, etc. Um, individual hedge funds tend to do well in most 
market conditions, but there's very few that can do well in all market conditions. Okay, but if we take some of the, you know, that, that period when you were running uh, Man Group, what, what would be the typical kind of annual returns that investors were experiencing? Um, in our average, uh, Man Group, in our average um, retail product, um, particularly the ones focused around AHL, um, the main product, um, they would typically have been earning 15 to 20% returns with about a 15 to 20% annualised volatility. Right, okay. Um, so a sharp ratio of about 0.8 to 1 um, in terms of risk return. Okay, so, so, so we've got you in the situation now where you're achieving some great success. When we come back after the break, I want to talk to you about how you've effectively used that success to move into other areas of investment. For now, Lord Fink, thank you very much. Thank you. Join us again in just a few moments. Welcome back to Money and Me with my guest, Lord Stanley Fink. Before the break, we found out how he achieved amazing success in the world of hedge funds. Now let's look at where he's gone on to invest in new fields since then. So, Stanley, tell me about, you know, once you've achieved that level of success, um, it's one thing to kind of make the money in business, but then it's a case of how do I transform that into long-term wealth? So what were the kind of processes you went through to, to move from that, that kind of high income phase into that investing for the long-term phase? It's a good question. I think my philosophy was very much driven by wanting to spend uh, the, the, the balance of my life doing something really meaningful for society. I'm very fortunate I've got three wonderful, well-adjusted children who all have good independent careers of their own. Um, I, I was able to have a, a portfolio that I knew was pretty balanced and safe and conventional. Mm. But I wanted to invest in new business because it's business and new business that fascinates me, particularly businesses that can have a sort of social and utilitarian purpose mm. as well as making money um, um, you know and making return because by doing that you can recycle the capital so I, I'm, I'm I'm interested in a range of businesses which vary from some very sort of green businesses um, renewable forestry new forest capital um, uh, businesses that measure the impact of, of, of human activity on the planet so I'm investing in a business called Ecometrica that, that really does that and helps companies measure the, the, the impact of their carbon footprint, etc. Right. Um, I'm invested in a number of businesses that supply things that are really important like Utopia, um, which is looking at new ways to build homes in more affordable, greener ways. And in businesses like British Pearl, which both... Um, help bring a new way for individuals to invest in the property market, get their foot in the property market mm. without the um, having either the sum of money or the the time to manage their property investments personally in the way that a buy-to-let landlord would have done. Mm. So it's really finding that balance. And, and I guess, um, although obviously you, you're looking for some kind of social uh, angle there, at the end of the day, it's still an investment decision and you come very much from a finance and investment background. So how, how do you go about assessing the, the propositions that are put in front of you and deciding which are the ones you are actually going to go for? It's a very good question. We, we have, um, after uh, realising one or two investments, um, I did share some of my wealth around the family. And I'm fortunate in that my oldest son and more recently my youngest son um, work in the um, financial world as well. And it was actually my oldest son, Alex's idea to have a property, uh, have a, an invest, a family investment club where we literally looked at investments together and made decisions together where we would invest. And while there'll be some investments that perhaps I'll do that they won't because my pockets are deeper and perhaps my risk tolerance is higher, it's a really fascinating process to hear from them the sort of businesses they want to invest in and see the way they operate because you get to see your, your children as grown-up businessmen in their own right, mm. whereas actually most of the other way you interact with your children, you end up seeing them like children, even though they're, in my case, in their 20s and 30s. Right. Uh, so it's been a really nice experience, both from a, a social interaction point of view 
um, as well as helping us get enthusiastic together about businesses. Okay. Now, I think, I think people always tend to be very, very quick to, to, to tell others about the successful investments, but I'd imagine not everything has gone according to plan. Have there been one or two of these that just didn't work out? Absolutely. As I, <laughs> as I once said to my wife when two or three of the early investments we made didn't go well, um, I said to her, lemons suddenly ripen faster than plums. <laughs> Um, unfortunately, that was true. We did have a couple of plums ripen, but no. I mean, we we we've had um, a number of investments that didn't work out for a variety of reasons, either over optimism by the management, or a factor we'd ignored, a competitive factor, or a critical mass issue. And the important thing there is to recognise failure early, to have an open and frank dialogue with management and to decide in advance what your risk tolerance is. I think the, the biggest mistakes I've made with hindsight is continuing to fund investments, hoping they'll turn around with a bit more money. And I think having the discipline to, while showing support to the investments you make, and I, I've never been somebody who cuts and runs at the first sign of adversity, mm. while being properly supportive and explain to the investments what your criteria would be to reinvest and to try and help them through their difficult times because all businesses have some difficult times. Um, it's having this been at a certain point to say enough is enough mm. and the areas where I, I kicked myself are the areas where I, I carried on too long um, and there are probably one or two of those and they are, they are things I think probably of all the things in our marriage, my wife berates me about the most. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but, uh, but if we talk about one of the success stories, which is, which is British Pearl, um, I, I guess we've got a whole generation now that feels like they're struggling to get on the property yes. ladder. But I suppose that, that this sort of platform offers them a way of getting into the property investing world without necessarily having to afford an entire property themselves. It, it does. It, it's a, British Pearl is a really good way for people to take um, an exposure to property that's appropriate for their overall portfolio. But if you think about it, most people live most of their lives, in my vernacular, short of property. Either they're not on the property ladder and they can see it going up and they get frustrated by it, mm. or they're in a house but they know at some point the family's going to grow and they're going to need to buy a bigger house. And the problem is, having been in both positions, in a rising market, it's very painful that as you make savings, the property you might want to buy goes up more. And particularly if you look at a year like this where the stock market's probably down about 10% on the year if you've saved from the beginning of the year in stocks. If you've bought low-risk ISAs, you'll probably made 2% in your year. Mm. Um, there is the chance, for example, in buy-to-let property to make in British Pearl today, you can make over 4% tax free in ISA in a loan product through them. And the equity, the properties are only put on the platform when they're pre let. So there's mm. probably been an 8 to 10% return in terms of income and capital gain in, in properties where British Pearl, where you invest in the equity of British Pearl mm. properties. Mm. And that's all secured by a property, so it's not. Um, debt that could go in theory, it could in theory go to zero, but it would have to mean properties worthless. So mm, mm. Um, it's quite, unlike. it's relatively safe as an investment strategy. Okay. So I think, you know, somebody smarter than me once said, it, it ain't what you make that matters, it's what you keep. And that brings us on to a sort of three-letter swear word spelled T-A-X. Yes. Um, now, there have been a lot of changes, uh, many of them introduced by, you know, your party with Mr. Osborne, things like Section 24, that have really kind of uh, impacted people in recent years. Even, in fact, I think the House of Lords recently saying that perhaps the powers of HMRC have gone too far. Um, I mean, what, what's your view on wh where things have been going? going with the government and its general approach to tax, tax planning and tax avoidance in recent years? Yes, I think some of the changes to root out some of the most artificial avoidance by changing legislation um, is sensible. Um, but I, I think that we should be very clear as a society to separate tax evasion, which is absolutely illegal, from tax avoidance, which has sort of become a dirty word and perhaps 
it's fair when there are schemes that are particularly artificial. Uh, but actually, it's one of those difficult subjective words because most people who write a will or do estate planning, you could argue that's tax avoidance. You could even argue that buying your whiskey um, as, you, as you cross over an airport duty-free is tax avoidance because all things being equal, it would be easy to pick up your whiskey from your local supermarket and pay tax on it. Mm. So uh, I, I think one's got to be very careful. Um, my, my personal view is if people think things are wrong, they should change the law um, and try and not do it retrospectively. And that's very much how I was brought up. I think some of the problems the House of Lords was talking about in the balance is probably to do with the merger between the Inland Revenue and Her Majesty's Customs and Excise, because the Customs and Excise have always had wider powers and probably been more aggressive historically. I think it's the combination of those two that has led to the specific situation that I think was spoken about. Mm, mm. Um, but that's something that, you know, uh, in, in political terms is well above my pay grade to comment about. Uh, but I, I've had most of my dealings over the years with the Inland Revenue, and most of the time they've been very fair to deal with. Okay, so so as, as, as we come to the end of our time together, what, what would you say from your experience of, of, of a lifetime in the kind of financial and investment industry, what would be the kind of golden nuggets you'd want to pass on to people that, that you've learned in your career? Um, I, I think in terms of investment, I'd say diversify. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't think because you've got a lot of equities, it's great because equities have in the past gone down and stayed down for quite a long time. Mm. So having an element of bonds or cash, an element of property, either directly or through a vehicle like British Pearl, is a good thing. So diversification is the nearest thing to free lunch you get in a financial market. Mm. I also think you build, you, 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 earn a living by what you earn, but you build a life by what you give. Mm. So some of the most emotionally rewarding things I've had is to, to, to be involved in some major philanthropic projects, and particularly to involve my children in some uh, with me and my family um, along the way. So that's been a great journey, and I've met some remarkable people, both um, in terms of the practitioners who help people within the charitable projects, and also some of my fellow donors who I've met who are people I would not have met in my normal business life. Perfect. Okay, well, that's a great way to end our time together. Lord Stanley Fink, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Graham. Join us next time on Money and Me for another fascinating financial life story. <laughs> <laughs>